The European Union is under fire over coronavirus. It's accused of failing to properly deal with the pandemic, even as two of its members are among the hardest hit worldwide. So can the union stay united and relevant? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome again to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby. The spread of coronavirus has shut borders across Europe and challenged the freedom of movement and the free movement of goods. Those are the very foundations of the European Union and some argue the bloc could be facing an existential crisis. European governments have been criticised for initially retreating behind their walls in response to the outbreak and its leaders are divided over how to tackle the crisis economically. They've also recently squabbled over how to share the debt burden. Germany and the Netherlands are among EU nations objecting to a joint debt initiative that also disappointed Spain and Italy. They were joined by France in calling for a grander plan of action. President Emmanuel Macron says his country is ready to help Italy. In an interview with several Italian newspapers, he added, Europe must feel proud and strong because it is but it must indeed go much further. This is why I defend budget solidarity, he said, in the management of this crisis and of its consequences. What worries me, he went on, is the illness of every man for himself. If we don't show solidarity, Italy, Spain or others would be able to say to their European partners, where have you been when we were at the front? I don't want this selfish and divided Europe. Here are some of the steps taken by EU countries to tackle this pandemic. Austria, France and Germany have sent protective masks to Italy. Germany has accepted COVID-19 patients from Italy and France. Medical supplies have been stockpiled and the export of protective equipment from the bloc banned. The EU is spending more than $155 million on the search for a virus vaccine, as well as treatment and testing. The European Central Bank is buying $840 billion of government debt to stimulate the economy. And Eurozone rules on government debt have been suspended to allow member states to spend what they need to survive the outbreak. OK, let's bring in our panel. Joining us today from Perugia in Italy, Giulia Alagna, a journalist and field producer working with foreign media. From Santander in Spain, Fabrice Potier, chief strategy officer at the political advisory firm Rasmussen Global. And from Berlin, we have Torsten Benner, director of the think tank Global Public Policy Institute. Welcome to you all. Giulia, can I come to you first? Paint us a picture of what it's like where you are right now. Well... It is quite a, the solitary confinement at the moment. Italy is still on lockdown, um, though the uh, rays in uh, contagions have uh, has diminished. We actually still have a growing number of people suffering from coronavirus and a growing number of deaths. So as of yesterday, we had 900 uh, in one day, a little less than the day before when we had 1,000. The whole of Italy remains on lockdown. Our government is currently working on um, new plans for uh, more money to put into the economy as um, we are trying to come out of it and understand that the crisis will be heavy. Um, all of the uh, major activities that are not directly linked to um, replenishing the healthcare system have been shut down and are currently stopped. And Fabrice in Santander, is that mirrored where you are? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, as you know, Spain is the, the second highest uh, country in, in Europe to be uh, hit by the uh, coronavirus. Uh, I think the number of deaths per day is, is increasing and every day. And I think everybody is holding their breath to see how things are going to develop next week. Uh, it is thought that next week will be probably the peak. Uh, and hopefully the beginning of uh, the stabilization of the rhythm of contamination and death. Um, however, uh, on the good side, the, the uh, Spanish public health system is, is pretty strong, uh, but obviously overwhelmed. So there's a lot of even citizen initiatives to send some uh, uh, 
uh, to um, scuba diving uh, masks to hospitals, which could be turned into uh, apparatus for ventilators. So I would say that the spirit is high. It's uh, week two of lockdown, two more weeks to go at least. Uh, and again, everybody is holding their breath to see how things are going. However, on the political side, the government is obviously uh, trying to maintain these measures across the country. But as you know, Spain is very decentralized. Every region has their own uh, uh, parliament and decisions. And there's a lot of politics going on. And, and the real question is whether we can still hold with a unified response for the next two weeks. And what will be the Spanish government economic answer? Uh, before the crisis, the Spanish government had barely a real economic policy to restart growth and employment, so let alone after the crisis. And this is the next big worry. Torsten, in Berlin, let's stay with the politics of this. Just to be clear, has the EU failed certain countries or done the perfect job as far as other countries are concerned? I think uh, the big countries, especially Germany, have uh, failed Italy and other countries in need initially. We're changing that, uh, but only very slowly. And now the big question is whether we can really turn a corner. I mean, why did we fail in the beginning? In the beginning, we, as Germany, we just put down our, uh, our national borders uh, like everybody else and set uh, export ban on all medical goods because we need them for ourselves. Uh, let's not ship anything uh, abroad, including to Italy. And we allowed uh, China to come in, as, uh, although that's the country that caused this pandemic, to come in as, uh, as the savior. We've also allowed uh, authoritarian leaders such as Prime Minister Orban to take advantage of, uh, of, uh, of this and cement their authoritarian rule. Now we're st slowly starting to adjust, at least in terms of the cross-border delivery of assistance. Uh, we've stepped up uh, as, as Germany. We're taking in patients from Italy and France. Uh, we're delivering uh, vital medical goods. So that's the first step. But the big question is uh, what, what, what uh, will Germany do in terms of joint fiscal relief for countries such as Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, that, are, that will be incredibly hard hit by this pandemic. Domestically, we've taken decisive action. Germany has... Uh, thrown all concerns about balanced budgets uh, away and uh, kind of uh, unveiled what our finance minister calls the bazooka. We've uh, spent billions of dollars in order to stabilize our economy. But so far, Mrs. Merkel has not said a single word in her important public speeches on other European countries and uh, the need to really have fiscal solidarity in Europe. Uh, the old German red lines are still in place. And that actually risks blowing up uh, the European Union. Uh, countries such as the Netherlands have a similar position as, as Germany. And uh, the Portuguese Prime Minister Costa was very right when he said it was repugnant on the part of the Dutch finance minister. The Dutch finance minister said, oh, we need to inquire why are these other countries not able to mount a strong fiscal response? Of okay. course they aren't. Because Just let uh, me put that idea, Torsten, fiscal of problems. fiscal relief yeah. to Julia in Perugia. Julia, you are there at the leading edge of this crisis. France, Spain, Italy, they have less monetary breathing room, if you will. They have less wriggle room anyway. And on top of that, social distancing means people do not go out. They don't put money into the economy. They don't spend. So fiscal relief is fine in three or six months. But as of now, what's the need where you are? Well, what we need right now is for Italy to be able to um, increase their public debt. There's no way going around that. And the former president of the ECB, Mario Draghi, the Italian former president of the ECB, has stated this uh, clearly on the Financial Times just a couple days ago. Um, Europe has to come together, has to be uh, run by solidarity and allow these countries that they call the south of Europe, which is Italy, but also Spain, Portugal, Greece, as you said, to uh, increase their um, uh, state debt. Uh, of course, this cannot happen if there is uh, if, if the ECB and the investment funds of Europe do not allow it, and if uh, the whole of Europe does not agree with this. Now, it seems like that will be um, allowed. Now, there was a meeting about three days ago among the European leaders. They have yet to uh, explicitly decide 
what the measures will really be. And they've given themselves two weeks to decide, even though Italy and Spain, uh, which are in the middle of the um, peak of their crisis, well, actually Spain has yet to see it, um, have asked that to come faster. Uh, Italy has also proposed what had been proposed uh, earlier um, in uh, also the former economic crisis for a shared a European bond. They're calling it now Corona bond to try and make the sound softer to the ears of countries like Germany and Austria and Finland, who, of course, uh, would prefer to keep um, the uh, state of the bonds as it is now. So each state can sell their own bonds. Well, Italy and Spain, and now also Macron from France, has declared that there should be some sort of measure to allow the European Union to sell Europeans, even if it was just for this crisis. And um, so Italy, I think Italy, Spain, and other countries uh, of the south of Europe are waiting to see whether the EU comes around and does as they have promised to create a unified plan to bring these countries out of the crisis, which, as you said, we're in it right now. It will probably get worse. And also bear in mind that Italy, but also Greece and Spain and also um, Portugal have already continued to, um, we've continued to struggle with the 20. Uh, 2009 crisis. Italy is made of small businesses. Uh, mostly the economic uh, web of Italy is made of small businesses, family-run businesses. A lot of them are in dire crisis. We've had to already uh, push the EU to allow us to make measures uh, for uh, higher unemployment funds uh, and so on. Okay. So the Fabrice, coronavirus crisis... Fabrice Potier in Spain, in Santander. What's the Spanish attitude morphing into being towards Brussels? Because you've got the UK cutting interest rates, on top of which you've got the US saying quantitative easing is the way forward. So that means print money or come up with these bonds that Julia was talking about. And you've got Christine Lagarde from the ECB saying, oh, the problem is down to nation states themselves. I think it's too early for uh, the general Spanish population to start looking a bit more at what the EU has done or has not done properly. I think people are really, again, uh, focusing on their own health, their own safety. But surely, like in Italy, that question will come uh, back to us. But you have to know that uh, Spain is quite different than Italy vis-à-vis uh, -vis the European Union. There is no fundamental anti EU uh, sentiments in, in, in Spain, because in Spain, the EU is regarded as part of the democratization of Spain, as part of the story of Spain getting out of uh, Franco's dictatorship. So EU is still very positively supported across the political spectrum, with few exceptions. But the reality, and, and that's what the previous uh, speakers said, I think we are facing here a double crisis. One about the lack of competencies of the European Union itself. It does not have competence for external border, and it does not have competence for public health, uh, which still remains very much the competence of the individual member states. And the second crisis, which is, I think, the real worrying part, is uh, the crisis of European solidarity among European member states. And like, again, the previous speaker was saying, you have different groups, uh, the thousand economy, including France, asking for basically a brand new approach to how you consolidate and strengthen the Eurozone. Something that already was pushed after 2008, never succeeded because of Germany, Austria, Finland, Netherlands uh, resistance. And, and I think here it's really creating, I would say, a, a fundamental tension about what's the What's the essence of the European project? Because if we do not accept to create more solid economic solidarity across Europe, there's really going to be a big question mark, I guess, in Italy, but also in France, where you have strong Eurosceptical movements like Salvini, Le Pen, who are going to use that to say, look, Europe is for nothing. Europe is not helping us. We are on our own and should focus on our own strengths. So I think there's going to be a day of reckoning in the coming weeks should the European member states not get their act together 
and manage to have something that is comprehensive and unified enough on the economic front. OK, Torsten Berner in Berlin. Is there a, a recalculation here that has to happen in Berlin, in Paris, the axis of the European Union and therefore for the European Commission as well? And it's this. The original calculation was post-Brexit, oh, every other European country has been cured of this idea that they might think about leaving the EU. And now... With those wealthy in the north, poorer in the south, Mediterranean countries, Italy, France, Spain, Portugal as well, they're looking in on this and going, actually, maybe a day of reckoning, to pick up on that idea from Fabrice, a day of reckoning might not be such a bad idea, not now, not in six months, but maybe in a year or 18 months or two years. Yes, there's a real, real, real danger that the European project will fall apart if we don't get this... Uh, this right now. This is an incredibly critical moment. Imagine uh, we don't agree on a modicum of fiscal solidarity with the hardest hit countries uh, in Europe. And then in a year's time, you have Prime Minister Salvini putting to the Italian people the question, why do we still uh, adhere to the European project? Why are we still members of the European Union? I think he'll have pretty good uh, arguments then for Italy to leave uh, that, that project if he wants to make the public case for that. And we need to uh, avoid supporting those anti-Europeans with our selfish, act, selfish actions. And the, the uh, responsibility is with Berlin, with the German government, and chiefly with Chancellor Merkel. Chancellor Merkel uh, let the Ger Germany through this crisis fine. She has an approval rating until now. Uh, the, it uh, crept up to 79%. And uh, so she has rebuilt her political capital. And now is the time for her to use that political capital in order to move her own party and the German public toward a more solidaric fiscal uh, position with uh, the rest of Europe to do away with these old red lines. And once, uh, it's a once in a lifetime thing. It's not Corona bonds forever, but uh, here we really need a different approach of fiscal solidarity with Italy and Spain. Not, it's not their fault they're in this uh, situation. This is an exogenous shock that is hitting us uh, all and uh, hitting the poorer countries uh, disproportionately. And so it's for us to come up with a joint response or the European project will fail. Uh, the Commission President von der Leyen, also a German, she said, we either face this crisis with one big heart or with seven, 27 small stone cold hearts. And right now, it looks more like this uh, 27 single small hearts. Okay. And uh, I think it's for Germany and other countries to make sure that we can kind of develop this one big heart okay. uh, in this Julia, uh, when, when von der Leyen goes on Italian television and says in bad Italian, we are all Italians, I guess I know what your reaction to that will be, so we won't even get there. But where you are in Perugia, right in the middle of Italy, take me through this, because I get the sense that northern Italy, asset-rich, cash-rich, doing OK, but as you go down south through the country, it becomes poorer, more working class, poorer, more working class, cash-heavy, not savings-heavy. And that's why we're seeing anger and frustration on the streets. That's why we're seeing the police being called to little supermarkets, etc. That's why we're seeing people on the sidewalks having arguments with the police saying, we have no money, we have no food, and the kids in the apartment, they're really hungry. Yeah, that is unfortunately correct. Um, Italy is very fragmented. Uh, the north, uh, which was also um, the, the area of Italy that was hit the hardest, and which is why our crisis will probably be uh, even more than we now realize, uh, is the most industrialized. And it's where all our productive sector really lies. It's like 40% of our production is in Lombardy, which is the region that was hit the most. As you go south, um, it's more based on services and uh, also based on uh, state assistance because unemployment rate is very high because the youth usually moves away and goes and works uh, north or in other parts of Europe. Um, so currently, after these three weeks of lockdown uh, in the south, and especially in cities like Palermo and uh, Naples, the capital of Sicily and the capital of Campania, we're seeing uh, a lot of stress among the people. So uh, bear in mind, most of them have under the table jobs or little day to day jobs that keep the family going. Now, in a lockdown, they're not able to do that, but they're not also um, they're they're not as able as other parts of Italy to claim for uh, state more state help.
So we are seeing families now that are struggling to pay for their food. Um, yesterday, there was a scare in Palermo. Uh, on social media, the police had noticed that there was a group of six or seven people and riots the supermarket. Thankfully, that was stopped. The mayor of Palermo has now put forth a program to distribute food for free to families that need it. Um, but also, there is there is organized crime, as everybody knows, in the South. And sure. they are taking, already there are signs of them taking advantage of the situation. Okay. Because organized crime flourishes where, when people have these type of problems. Okay. So the state must respond right away. Okay, Fabrice, briefly, uh, what is it for you that the, the EU or the Commission doesn't do that it should be doing? I mean, why did they go into a huddle and spend the first month of this crisis bickering? Why didn't they look at the countries who've handled it properly? <laughs> South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore. You know, the models to handle it properly were there in plain sight. Yeah, because as I mentioned earlier, it's also a crisis of competence. The European Commission does not have competence of our public health. Uh, again, this is the national member states who, who handle their own public health measures and policies and spending. So all they could do uh, in Brussels is to sit and watch and put a good face on whatever decisions uh, the member states were taking. And you often saw basically member states chipping away chunk of European common policies like uh, Schengen, uh, like even the fiscal criteria, and the European Commission had no other choice but just to put a good face on it and, and move along. So I think the, the, the big question, hopefully, when we'll uh, uh, get out of the, the hardest part of the crisis will be, what are the kind of new competence we need to give to Brussels so we have a more coordinated approach in the future? Uh, and I think on public health, I don't think it's going to become a European Commission business, but on public health data, meaning how you pinpoint who has done what, who has traveled where, I think there could, will be a big discussion at the European level about what kind of legal framework to make sure that we can control public health data, but also respect the privacy okay. of every individual. Torsten, briefly, from Wuhan to Washington, the coronavirus crisis has blindsided every president, every politician around the world, and it's not done yet. People are saying this might cost Donald Trump his job in the White House. He might not go back in again. Could this cost the European Union's presidents and prime ministers their European dream? I think it could. And uh, as I said before, it's a make or break it uh, moment for the European Union. And it's for the countries that are doing relatively well fiscally uh, and in the crisis like Germany to actually make sure that uh, we invest uh, in dealing with uh, the aftermath, uh, which will be incredibly severe for all of us, also in, in Germany, but uh, for, the, for the hardest hit countries. And along the way, we shouldn't forget the rest of the world. Uh, many developing countries uh, in Africa, Latin America, this is only starting to, uh, to affect them. And uh, we need to stand ready to help uh, in, in solidarity. And we shouldn't... Uh, forget the, the migrants uh, at our doorsteps uh, that are living in incredible, incredibly difficult con uh, conditions in camps in Greece, in, in Turkey. And uh, we shouldn't just turn inwards because this is about Europe as an open society. And if we want to preserve Europe as an open society, we need to make sure we invest in it and go against those, the authoritarians, be they from Beijing or be they in, in Budapest, that they take uh, advantage of this. Last word to Julia in Perugia. Julia, World War II united Europe. Might coronavirus divide it irreparably? Unfortunately, that, I think, is at high risk. Uh, Italy itself has a large number of Eurosceptic people. And already there are talks of whether this government currently, which is, which is currently loved, but whether we'll survive after this crisis and if we have to go back to elections, because as you know, Italy works on coalitions. Now, if we go back to elections, if the EU does not respond strongly and doesn't show solidarity, there is a likelihood that the Eurosceptic groups will win, like Salvini. Uh, and that could bring, as mentioned before by the other hosts, 
to Italy leading a sort of break of the EU and wanting to withdraw, because there are discussions among the people. And differently from other countries of the South, we do think that Italy, there are a lot of people that think that Italy might be well off better on its own if it has to constantly um, confront the EU uh, with its restrictions on the way we manage our public debt. OK, we must leave it there. Thank you to our guests, Julia Alagna, Fabrice Potier and Torsten Benner. And thank you to you too for your company. You can see the programme again anytime on the website, aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or the conversation carries on on Twitter. That's at AJ Inside Story. Or tweet me, I'll tweet you back. I'm at Peter Dobby one from me, Peter Dobby, and the team here in Doha. Thank you for watching the show. We will do it all again at the same time tomorrow. I will see you very soon. Bye-bye.